Um, let's talk about user design. Uh, my name is John McQuaid, for those who don't know me. Uh, I graduated from Leslie University in 2015 as a designer. I'm a designer by practice. Um, and then when I graduated, uh, a group of very smart, um, ambitious faculty kind of cornered me and said, well, we have this thing we're, we're developing. Um, we want you to be a part of it. You want to stick around for two years. So I said, sure, I, I love school. I, I have plenty of money lying around. So why not? This is great. One of those things was true, but I decided to say yes. And this program, this master's program that I, I was going to kind of pilot and just basically taken to my own was this thing called Design for Learning. And Design for Learning, in a nutshell, and I've had two years to practice this elevator speech, so I think I'm getting pretty good at it. Design for Learning takes three things, uh, design, uh, educational theory, and emerging technology. And breaks down silos and pits them against each other, finds out relationships between these three things, uh, now, five years, 10 years, 20 years into the future. Because these things are inevitably going to collide in a very big way in the future if they haven't already. Uh, for technology, for example, in the past 50 years, we've, had, we've gone from computers that fill rooms the size of this uh, to computers that fit in our pockets and can do a million times more computations per second than computers in 1965 could have ever dreamed of. Um, at the same time, in this time span, we've had a steady decline in education system. We've had, and related to the rest of the world, we've been failing our children. So how come we have this high level of technology and just technolo technological advancement, but our, our children are still failing in the classroom? And that was the major question I asked myself. I don't think I ever told you this, but this was the kind of the, the driving force behind this master's program is what's going on? What's the breakdown in communication? So I'm going to talk about that. When I'm not at school, my nine to five, I work in a place called Virginia Village Media Group. Uh, and if there's a better real-life example of these three things working together in harmony in the real world, uh, this has got to be it. Uh, we do interactive museum exhibits uh, all over the world. Basically, anything that's not in a glass case says do not touch, aka the fun things in the museum, we, I get to design those. So every day I get to go to work, every day's different, and I get to play around and have fun and create these really engaging learning experiences. So as a designer of Richard Lewis Media Group, I have kind of this tightrope to walk between these two major kind of bodies of people we have. On one side, we have museum higher-ups who have these learning goals and all this content they've been curating for decades. That's the, the, really, literally the definition of museum is just curating content, creating this great content. And at the same time, we have their audiences, whoever it is, whether it's a children's museum or uh, an art museum or a history museum. The, the audiences are vastly different, but we have to find a way to interface um, the learning goal of the museum and the various needs, limitations, capabilities of the end user, whoever they have. So if that's not a great scaled down version of a classroom, taking a learning goal in three to five minutes, creating some sort of meaningful experience in a standalone application, whether it's you know a touch screen, we're basically we're limited to whatever today's technology is. Right now, we're really big into 4K televisions with touch capability. So that's those are the cards we're dealt. We need to figure out a way to create a standalone experience for a child. We can't have a museum worker or one of us sitting behind guiding a, a child through something. This thing needs to be able to speak for itself with the with the visual hierarchy and technical skills that Christina mentioned that we have developed over our years. So end user in a lot of the cases are, are children or families. And th that's kind of the idea of, end of user design, this idea. And it's, I've kind of spread out these pieces of paper for the definitions and any fun kind of links you guys can link to. But user design in a really small nutshell is the idea of keeping the user limitations, capabilities in mind throughout the entire design process. It's, it was number four on your list of basically understanding your audience. And as my job is basically 99% that, we aren't really worried about the technical skill because we're assuming we have this. It's a matter of really putting yourself in the, the shoes of the end user and being able to make design decisions based around that. Uh, any design decisions, color, typography, all of this stuff is based around what the end user needs. So everything in this room really was based and designed with an end user in mind. Like the, the, the doors you all came in through are six feet eight inches tall by 
three feet wide. Uh, that's an architectural standard that's based around what we are considering the average human height. If humans were the size of cats, I'm sure the doors would be slightly smaller. Now, if the, the, the lights are shining in a brightness of around 300 to 500 lux, uh, for those not familiar with light brightness units, um, that, that's based on what the human eye considers to be you know, comfortable brightness for indoor viewing. And that's based off of numbers. Um, even the chairs you're all sitting in are about 16 to 18 inches off the ground, and that's based around the average human um, dimensions. I know this because I looked it up. This is the chair design standards. So we have, uh, I'm going to call him Al, the average man, and he's very happy because this chair has been designed for the average man. And he's, this is the perfect chair. He, there's no room. He's very happy. Problem being, when we design for Al, the average man, is that not everyone is average. This idea of average. Oh, women, it's absolutely. Yes, well, I'm just saying, for some reason, they stuck a man in here, and you know, I don't know. This, is, this actually is most of the case. We're designing for white middle-aged men. Not that's, yes, not surprising. Yeah, not surprising at all. So this is our end user. So if I'm designing a chair, I say, mm, this is a good approximation for 80 to 90% of people who are going to be sitting in my chair. That's pretty good money, and that's pretty good odds. And if you don't fit my chair, then don't buy it. That's what the, that's, it's a math problem at that point. Is this is the end user. Problem is, for the hundreds of years, we've been designing for this average person. And this is not great. Uh, it started back in 1840. Uh, an astronomer by the name of Adolf Ketele from Belgium. From Belgium. Uh, he's an astronomer. Technology in 1840 wasn't fantastic. It wasn't up to NASA standards. So he was measuring stars and celestial bodies with inherent error. So what you did as a scientist in 1840 was you took a large body of data, you did these longitudinal studies over time, and you averaged out your data in the best way you could. That way you had an idea of a trend, you could find patterns, et cetera, et cetera. And it was well understood in the scientific world that taking averages was a very normal thing. The Ketele decided that he could maybe port this over to a couple other things. He thought, he thought he'd be clever. He came across this data set uh, in 1840 of 6,000 numbers, basically an 1840 version of a spreadsheet, and it had the chest circumferences of 6,000 Scottish soldiers. Because uh, back then, uh, in 1840, when you joined the army, you got a uniform that was made for you, it was tailored specifically for you. There was no such thing as sizes, there was no such thing as a small, medium, large, they were tailored specifically to the shape of your body. That's where this data set came. So Ketele thought he'd be very clever, and he added all these up, 6,000 numbers, added them all up, probably hired an intern, because at 18.4 it's a lot of work, and he divided by 6,000, and to get this average, he said very, very prominently and proudly that <coughs> the average chest circumference of a, of a human man is 39 and 3 quarters inches. Very proudly, it's science. It was fantastic. And the idea was that he thought that humanity and the higher beings of the world were striving towards this average. Everybody outside of this average was error. This is, this is crazy thinking at the time, but it really caught on and became a celebrity, 1850, 1860. So much so that a guy by the name of Abraham Lincoln really dug this idea, and he was losing a war, a very expensive war. Thousands and thousands of people are dying on the Union side. So he hires these scientists, these mathematicians, to basically do this giant study of his, of his soldiers to say, well, how, what are these people eating? What's their sizes? Give me as much information as you possibly can about these soldiers. And turns out, based off this, all the measurements that he took of his soldiers, he created the first example of small, medium, and large military clothing sizes, where it all started. And it was a cost-effective way to fund a war. War is very expensive, and contrary to popular belief, militaries don't like to spend any more money than they have to. So this is where it all came from. Fast forward to this little thing. So when you design for the average, you design for this very specific person, and I like this term a lot. I found it a psychology term, it's called task selection bias. So we tell the person to perform a task, they believe they should be able to do it, if they can't, they feel guilty and blame themselves. And if we design, say, if we say this, this is a small, medium, and large size for clothing, if you don't fit in this, you're wrong. 
you know, something wrong with you because, you know, we've created these boxes for you to fit in, you don't fit a box, so therefore you've been marginalized and you no longer matter. It's kind of, in, in essence, this is what happened. And we've continued to use this idea of averages, create these measurements for another 100 years. For 1930, we were creating cockpits for these new machines, these new airplanes, basically. And people in 1920, 1930 were quite small, and these cockpits were really small. So they worked out fine. They, they measured out these, these thousand pilots, and they said, no, the cockpit needs to be this size. The cockpit, everything's fine. In 1950, they're using the same measurements from 1920. People got larger, significantly larger. And the US Air Force realized that pilots were dying, not in battle as much as they were dying in training because they literally couldn't fit in the cockpits and control their planes effectively, and they were crashing their planes. So a guy by the name of Gilbert Daniels, uh, a Harvard grad, very young guy, was tasked with doing another one of these catalyst studies, basically taking a thousand pilots at the time and measuring out their distances and creating a new system for these, co for these cockpits. Founds out, obviously, that you know, people got bigger. So cockpits got bigger, everything's great. But Gilbert Daniels took it a step further and went, oh, well, let's hold on a second. I took 10 different body measurements to create this super average dude, this hypothetical average person. How many people actually are average? In the thousand people that I, I actually I, I measured, I measured these 10 different body parts, these 10 different things that I thought were important. And how many people were actually average? And spoilers, none of them. No one fits in what was called this average. So the average person, out of the average person, is a mythical creature that doesn't actually exist. So why are we designing for him? And we continue to design for these average people in everything. We think about, well, let's bring it back to education. We're using standardized testing to quantify intelligence. And if we can't quantify the length of the, the, the chest circumference of somebody, something that we can actually quantify, how do we quantify someone's intelligence? Or how can, we, how can we design for someone that doesn't exist and leave this giant mass of people who are being marginalized? 10% I mean, of people, 10% uh, of males are colorblind in some way or form. Uh, seven, 15 to 20% of people over the age of 18 have some sort of hearing loss. This isn't, these aren't these, these kind of rare instances, this is just the normal. People are on spectrums one way or the other. There's no such thing as putting people in boxes and hoping that they fit in them. So it's the idea of user design, smart user design. And when we think about, when I think about design for uh, museums, we're not thinking of the six-year-old white male. We can't do that anymore. We're thinking of everyone. We're thinking about their parents. We're thinking about their, their brothers and sisters who maybe can't read. We're thinking about universal design for everything. I mean, it goes back to education, universal design for learning. It's basically the idea, um, it's a framework that allows teachers to reinforce their learning environments and materials for a wider audience, for everybody, based on just cognitive science. I like to, I'm gonna go into this because it's so cool. I love you. I think it's the coolest thing in the world. Give me a second. So this is cool because it is based on science. It's based on parts of the brain, uh, recognition, strategic, effective. It's basically the what, how, and why. They pinpointed what parts of the brain actually do these actions. And they say, well, everyone goes through this process to learn. This is, like the, this is how people learn. Um, but people learn differently. We have these, these different cognitive differences. And people who don't fit in what we're calling the average box are fail are getting failed out of college. They're out of our schools. Like schools are failing them because we're not designing for everyone. We're designing for whoever's designing for the average person. We're, called, we're designing for this average, non-existent person. So, to go back to design for your audience, what we do in the museum industry is designing for everybody. We have to, because we can't really predict. There's never going to be a pack of six-year-olds that go into a museum by themselves. They're going to be with parents. Parents need to be able to assist them in whatever activity they're doing. Um, we need to be able to reach everybody in a museum exhibit. So, I like this quote as well. I'm just going to be pulling stuff. I'm also doing this in Photoshop. Because my brain doesn't work like PowerPoint, where I can actually follow a strict set of things. I need to be able to jump around. So 
I like this quote a lot, so much so that I've labeled it quote of the century. Raymond Nickerson is a, he, was a P, um, he has a PhD from Tufts, he was a psychologist, and he, he, in 1969 he said this, which just blows my mind, because in 1969 the most advanced computer was this thing. But it says, sorry for the overlay, the need for the future is not so much computer-oriented people as for people-oriented computers. And he, it was a great idea. We can see in 1969, that's the, the most advanced computer we had um, at our disposal. This brought us to the moon somehow. I love this because it has these buttons. I, I love this thing. It has these buttons, verb and noun, which <laughs> I don't know how someone uses this. But our verb and noun in you know, 20 years, less than 20 years, we get the Apple Lisa, which is Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak's kind of answer to more human-friendly interfacing. And then we see, obviously, in 2007, with the in invention of the iPhone, we have touch bases. So we no longer we have to type in computer language to talk to a computer. A computer is now speaking our language. We're dragging files into folders. We're dragging them into trash cans. We're no longer typing lines of code. We're doing very human things. And this is the progression we're going towards. More human, more user-based, design solutions for our technology. So in a nutshell, I don't know how much time I have. Seven minutes. Seven minutes, that's a new record. But that's I've including Q&A. Including Q&A? I'll just do some Q&A then. But that's basically the nutshell is designing for universal users. It's not only the trend, it's the right thing to do. It's the idea that if you design for everybody, you're going to get better <laughs> products that are better used, you're not going to marginalize any people that shouldn't be marginalized, you should embrace their differences because if it works for everyone, it's going to work for your average person. So that's what I have to say, at least so far. So if you guys have any questions, I'd love to hear them. I just bombarded you, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes? So back to your museum picture, which sure. are different. Uh, I can go over those as well. I'm pretty familiar with all of those projects. So is the, the implications of this that you have to have multiple stations, or are the stations themselves designed for multiple users? It completely depends. Uh, right now, a lot of the trends, museums love the idea of multi-touch, multi-user things. Whether that's the right solution, another question. But you know, the museum higher up, they see these bigger screens, these more resolute screens. And like, we want this. We want 50 kids on this at the same time. I mean, multiple sides, multiple approaches. So oh yeah. The, these are very. What's interesting is these are very four different modalities. Sure. And so, it, it is you, are you striving to push the museum to have four modalities, or is each one of those modalities able to be used in a significantly different way? It's very, it's very specific to a specific learning goal. So okay. when we design something, it's, it's the museum saying, we want this idea, this idea, and this idea to get across. Uh, but make it fun, make it engaging, uh, make it productive and exciting. Get people, because basically museums are dying. They know this, they know they need to adapt technology. People aren't going to museums, they're Googling in front of screens. So how can we get children to get to museums? And so we are given a learning goal where we kind of synthesize what's important, and given our technology, our budget limitations, our time limitations, we create a solution that fulfills that learning goal, but at the same time is accessible to all. What's been your most challenging, uh, what, what's been the, the most difficult challenge you've had in designing for a museum for children? For children? <laughs> so, actually, I'll bring it up right now. This will be great, actually. This is actually perfect timing. Thank you, Brenda. <laughs> Uh, this is great because I'm not. So this is a project I actually worked on. This is one of the hooks I brought. This is how I brought people in here. This is Hohan Museum in Inner Mongolia, which is part of China, as I realized. And it's entirely in Mandarin, which meant that I had to design entirely in Mandarin. And we had to struggle with translators and everything. And the learning goal for this was basically um, so it was emotional literacy for children three to seven. These children may may or may not be able to read, but they can they have a working understanding of Mandarin. 
and the idea is that we're creating these collages, these visual sentences, um, to show that you can be sad, and then you can do things to change your mood to be happy, and it's okay to go back and forth. It's like emotional literacy is very important at that age. Um, so this this would be in a museum, a 27-inch touchscreen, and it says touch begin. This is probably the biggest barrier for us English speakers. Is what, in, what am I actually being asked here? Well, it says touch to begin. So as soon as you touch it, you understand that's your input. Uh, and it says some things. I'll turn the volume up. This is all spoken actually in Mandarin as well. And just so student kids can understand it, the idea is, and I'm paraphrasing because I really don't know what it says. It says, you can change your mood from sad to happy. Let's learn how. So you click go. And what it's doing is telling you to take a picture. So you say you want to take a picture of you being sad. Uh, so you take a picture of you being sad. I don't know if I can do that at the moment. <laughs> you take four pictures. That's a good one. And then you pick which one you like the best. And it gets added to your collage. You continue. And you get to choose two things that make you happy. That's what it says here. So you say, I like to... Uh, I like to draw. Oh. I love the words, they're fantastic. And these are all illustrations that I did based on what I believe a child that's three to six years old in Mongolia would really appreciate. I mean, this took, this, these little guys took probably more work than anything else on the screen just to get them right. You know, they had to feel, feel kind of tactile and cute. You feel like you can squeeze them and you're all happy about it. How can I can never write. <sighs> you, you just, boom, testing, testing. We had to make a test, uh, we couldn't really find Mandarin children ar around, so we, just, we had to just find children in general, but like, we asked them, what do you think about these guys? Like, we like them. So, but they, they start off as kind of stick figure or lanky people, and just didn't really show the cuteness that I was going for. So you click these two things, and it shows you what can you do to make others happy. And using color to say this is us to us, this is someone else who may be sad, blue, even in China is a signifier for sadness. So we use this, we use kind of color to show these things. And I say, I like to um, play sports with people and I give people flowers. Well, I know what it says. But we go much more. And now you take another picture to finish it off of you being happy. Say, <laughs> this is a good one too. Click go is your visual sentence. This is what makes me. This is sad. This is what makes me happy. And this is me happy at the end. And it's a quick. No more than two minutes. A uh, child can walk themselves through this. Click go. Their sentence gets added to the rest of the people. And this gets populated over time throughout the day. These are my coworkers. That's. Uh, I don't know what that is, but um, this is great too. But yeah, this is, this is something that's meant to be uh, put in a museum where you're just populating it and you start to see your happiness and sadness in context with other people. So if that didn't interest your question, this was incredibly challenging. <laughs> How long did it take you to do that? Thank you. Uh, about, this is from beginning to end when I first got the, uh, the learning goals and everything, um, the uh, design standards. About six months turnaround time, which is fairly luxurious in our field. So, one more question. I can probably get one more question in here, right? Can I answer it quick enough? Anybody? Well, thank you. Oh, I have a question. One more. Okay, so looking back, so you had a BF, you have a BFA in design yes. from us, and then you've now done all these other things. Mm -hmm. You've had a lot of other coursework. What do you think was the most significant? thing beyond your design? I took a psychology class. I've been telling everybody this. I took a developmental psychology class um, with people who were in the field, and it was fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. I learned what so much. What class was that? Was that GSAS? GSAS. That was GSAS? GSAS. Fascinating. Way over my head, but I loved with it. With counselors? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, <laughs> and not, I, didn't, I, I never took a psychology class. Right. And you were kind of a fish out of water, from what I understand. Uh, yeah, quite <laughs> I learned a lot, though. It was really great. They took me in. <laughs> yes, thank you all, and uh, enjoy the rest of the day.